Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Harnessing Data for Violence Prevention, Safety and Opportunity. Uh, as noted in the program, my name is Maurice Klassen and I'm a program officer with the John T. John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation as well as your moderator for this panel. Uh, this is the last panel of the afternoon and thus uh, we recognize we are the only thing between you and a break and perhaps some refreshments and maybe even some wine. So we will do everything we can to keep you on your toes and provide a <coughs> stimulating uh, conversation. Luckily, we have a fascinating topic and three very interesting experts in the arena with some interesting things to say and some interesting studies to share. So if you end up not on your toes by the end of this presentation, you have only one person to blame, and that is, of course, the moderator. The MacArthur, so why am I here? The MacArthur Foundation has been interested and dedicated to supporting programs that provide a safe, promote a safe and peaceful world for decades. From supporting programs that build on neighborhood development to recent innovations in anti-violence to Chicago's anti-violence uh, reduction strategy, as well as to institutional support for programs such as the University of Chicago Crime Lab, the foundation is committed to the idea that it in order to have a healthy and prosperous community, we must all feel safe from violence. As Elena mentioned earlier, MacArthur's interest in cities is spurred by a belief that cities will dominate our lifetime and will dominate the next generation of entities impacting our lives. Questions of whether governance structures are currently designed in cities to address modern problems and how leaders respond to the increasing availability of data are critical to the health and sustainability of the modern metropolis. When dealing with violence, there is a sentiment in some sectors and in some areas of politics of, okay, now what? As many of us know, since the 1990s, cities in the United States have seen a precipitous decline in rates of violence, homicide, and crime. No city likely better represents this than New York. From an absolute number of homicides of over 2,000 in 1991 to last year's total of just over 300, we've seen an astronomic drop in U.S. cities. Now, in New York City, the rate is under five per 100,000 of number of homicides. One look, need look only to Medellin to see international trends. In 1991, Medellin experienced 6,300 homicides in a city that's actually smaller than the city of Chicago. Yet, by 2012, they'd seen a decline to 1,271, and that is a rate of 30 per 100,000. And of course, even here at home in Chicago, though the media reports may have you think differently, we have also seen a precipitous decline from a high of over 900 in 1991 to last year just over 400, a rate of 15.65 per 100,000. But yet as more people move to cities, the problem of violence becomes more salient and enters our conversation more consistently. And stubborn problems still exist. Any rate of violence is probably too high, and the gains that we've noted in the decrease in U.S. cities have not been shared evenly. In a recent report by Professor Andrew Papachristos from Yale University, the study of a showing of the decrease in crime and violence in the city of Chicago showed that many areas in the, in the city, south and west, did not experience the same precipitous decline as those areas north of the city. And further, there's a worrying lack of awareness and lack of discussion among many decision makers in the space about what actually works and how to implement it. Within that context, we find big data with incredible opportunities and challenges and ask ourselves how, given the gains that we've made over the past two decades, do we leverage what is working and defund what is not? How do we help those existing programs and find evidence to support further programming? And most importantly for today's conversation, how do we connect the insights made by researchers on the ground to decision makers making final decisions on implementation and financing. Fortunately, in Chicago, we have a great laboratory and three practitioners in this space here with us today. Today's panel will discuss some promising returns in the field of data and evidence in reducing rates of violence, and specifically the values of randomized controlled trials to make progress in important urban problems. So let me introduce our three speakers, and then I'll get out of the way. First is Dr. Jonathan Garayan, Associate Professor of Human Development and Social Policy, and chair of the Institute for Public Policy Research at Northwestern University, as well as the co-director of the Urban Education Lab at the University of Chicago. Second, actually, second, will be Mark Saint, a practitioner, a site director for Match Corps in Chicago. He's a pastor, writer, and social justice advocate whose prior in, uh, experience was actually pastoring at the Cross Street Baptist Church in London, uh, London England. 
but he is, in fact, educated here in Chicago at uh, South Southern Illinois University as well as Northwestern University. And lastly, Dr. Jens Ludwig, the McCormick Foundation Professor of Social Sciences Administration here at the University of Chicago, and the co-director of the Urban Education Lab as well as the director of the Crime Lab. And with that, I'll defer to Dr. Graham. Thank you. So uh, crime and violence are a huge problem all over the world. Each year, a total of about uh, half a million people are murdered year worldwide, with millions more victims of other crimes. Uh, this has been a problem that's been incredibly difficult to solve. While the United States has uh, about two million people in prison, uh, the overall homicide rate in the United States hasn't declined. Uh, is not all that much different than it, now than it was in 1950 or n even in 1900. Uh, you know, sometimes big social problems persist because they're really hard to solve, and other times big social problems persist because we're focused on the wrong things. And what I want to suggest today is that it's possible that um, solving the, the crime and violence problem might be as simple as teaching people to stop, look, and listen before they act. This might seem like a crazy idea, but I hope uh, after seeing some of the results from some of the work that we've been doing at the University of Chicago Crime Lab, uh, it won't seem quite as crazy. So here's a, an example of what uh, this problem looks like here in Chicago. So on, on June 2nd of 2012, in the South Shore neighborhood, just a few miles from the University of Chicago, at 3 in the afternoon, there were two groups of teens arguing in the middle of 73rd Street about whether someone in one of the groups had stolen a bike from, one of the, uh, from someone in the other group. Uh, as the two groups started to separate, someone pulled a gun and, uh, and fired and hit Jamal Lockett, age 16, in the chest, who was then raced by ambulance downtown along Lakeshore Drive and pronounced dead at Northwestern University Hospital's emergency department. And then two weeks later, the Cook County State's attorney charged the shooter, Calvin Carter, age 17, with first-degree murder. This is not an unusual case. Chicago police data show that nearly three-quarters of all homicides stem from some sort of altercation. Basically, uh, they start with an argument over essentially nothing, and then it ends in tragedy. So why do people engage in violent and criminal behavior? One common explanation is poverty. So people are struggling to make ends meet, and when that's the case, uh, taking a bike or taking a bike back seems like a big deal. Uh, and the, when the options for jobs in the legal labor market are, are scarce, um, there's not much to lose by engaging in crime. Another argument people have posed is uh, what you might call a, quote, inadequate development of, the moral, of some moral sense, which was perhaps most famously articulated by University of, Perfense, University of Pennsylvania professor John DiUlio when he warned about a new generation of super predators that were coming. And both of these, these theories of crime, either economic poverty or moral poverty, uh, imply that criminals are deeply committed, that, that uh, they're deeply committed to engaging in crime and that it will be very, very hard to change their behavior. And it's understandable that people have uh, a view of criminals, uh, a, a view like this of criminals, especially in light of the very high recidivism rate that we see in the United States. Nearly two-thirds of people who are released from state prison are arrested again within three years. Uh, the idea that, that criminals are deeply committed to crime has led countries like the United States to um, essentially give up on crime prevention and re rehabilitation and focus on locking people up, which we've done a very good job of in, in, in America. But I want to suggest a different view that we have of why people might commit crime. Uh, and to get a sense of this view, I, I want you to indulge me in a, in a bit of a game. I need, uh, we need some audience participation in this one. So I'm going to show you some slides. And what I want you to do is call out the color of the object in the middle of the slide. And it's very important that you yell it out loud, OK? Black. Black. All right, we need, we need more audience participation than that, or it will not work. All right, I'm going to try that again. Ready? Black. Yeah. Red. Red. Green. Green. Yellow. Blue. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it worked. It always works. <laughs> So maybe you got a little ahead of yourselves there. If only you had slowed down, you could have named the color instead of reading the word. So why did we do that? The reason is that we think that something similar might be driving some of the criminal violent behavior that's carried out by people who are supposedly deeply committed to criminal behavior. So we see lots of examples in the real world of people responding very quickly or even automatically to their environment without pausing to think about what they're doing. This is a, an idea that uh, was one of the key points made in a recent book by the Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. 
Sometimes, uh, most of the time, these sort of automatic responses are adaptive to the environment that we live in. Uh, for instance, maybe Calvin Car Carter was, has developed a script that he lives by that says, I can't let people think I'm a pushover, which in, the, uh, in a neighborhood where you know, police are overwhelmed and it might actually be uh, adaptive to develop a reputation for being tough to avoid uh, uh, future victimizations. But that can lead to a tragedy when you have a 38 semi automatic ha automatic handgun in your waistband. So we decided to uh, test this theory in the largest juvenile detention center in the United States, which is not that far from here, the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center, which is sometimes called the JTDC. In 2007, there was a court case that led the federal courts to uh, take over the, the juvenile detention center in Chicago and uh, appoint a federal administrator. The federal administrator implemented a series of reforms. Namely, he broke the 500-bed facility into 10 50-bed facilities and started implementing uh, a program called, based on cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, in some of those uh, units. Um, for various reasons, which I won't go into, he was only able to do that in about half of them. And for a period of about two years, the kids, the youth who were uh, coming into the juvenile detention center in, in Chicago, were randomly assigned to either go to one of the units that had the CBT program or one of the units that was doing the status quo. So what is CBT and what does it lo look like in practice at the JTDC? So CBT is basically a program that teaches people to think about their own thinking. It shows people how their thoughts lead to actions and then helps them change the types of thoughts and the types of thinking that leads to actions that they want to avoid and helps people break the link between the types of thinking that leads them to actions they want to avoid and those behaviors. Um, in practice at the JTDC, the, the youth who were in the residential units that were doing CBT would have group sessions for about an hour a day, every day. The typical stay is about three to four weeks. Um, and they would um, do uh, CBT during this, this hour. So what, what do the results look like? So here, here is a graph that shows um, the fraction of kids who, are, who have come back to the JTDC after their release over time. So the first month is month one. It says about 15 to 20 percent of the kids who are released from the JTDC come back within a month. By about five or six months, it's about half of them. And if, after about a year, about two-thirds of the kids who, were, who have been released have come back to the JTDC. So we talked to the, um, the counselors who were implementing the cognitive behavioral therapy program and asked them about how they thought it was going. And they, they believe very deeply in, the effect, in the, what they're doing. But they said, you know, we just keep seeing the kids coming back. And so they're essentially constantly faced with evidence of failure. Now, the nice thing is that we have this random assignment, so we've got a, we've got a comparison group that on all, else, on all other dimensions, they should be, on average, basically the same. We flipped, someone, you know, the, the administrator flipped a coin, and there's, you get heads, you get CBT. If you get tails, you didn't. And so we can do the same graph of the kids who got CBT, and in fact, the rate of coming back is lower. So the, the line on the bottom, I'm colorblind, but I think that's red. Uh, the line on the bottom is the kids who got CBT, and the line on the top is the one who didn't. Okay, so the difference is about three or four percentage points. And if you just focus on the kids who actually got the program, it's two or three times that. So that might seem small, um, but uh, the, importantly, the cost-benefit analysis basically shows that for every dollar that you spend on this program, the social value of, of, of benefits is between four and eight dollars. And that, that only counts the reduced cost of having to house the kids at the JTDC. It doesn't, e it doesn't even include the benefits of reduced crime that they might be engaged in. And this is all, you know, so these are huge benefits relative to costs. And the staff, who are the ones who believe in it the most, they couldn't tell because they're seeing the, the kids coming back constantly. So this is, you know, evidence of the, the, the power of randomized controlled trials where you have a comparison group to, to compare to. Uh, and some of the, the lessons, you know, so most violent offenders, I believe, are, are not bad kids. Um, you know, first of all, non-poor kids make bad decisions too, and they just have uh, lots of safety nets to help them out. They don't end up in the juvenile detention center. And, and this idea that most kids are not, uh, who are making, who are ending up in the detention center are not really bad is, is illustrated well by this quote from one of the detention staff who said to us, uh, you know, 80% of the kids in here, sorry, 20% of the kids in here are criminals and they should be locked up. But the other 80%, I say to them, 
if I could just let you redo 10 minutes of your lives, you wouldn't be here. And so this program, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy and programs like it that teach people to stop, look, and listen, basically help kids change that 10 minutes of their lives. Uh, you know, the bad news is that we might have tragically misdiagnosed the problem, the crime and violence problem, and been locking people up unnecessarily for a long time at very high cost. And the good news is that thanks to a randomized evaluation, we might have learned a much lower cost way to solve, uh, not, not only lower cost, but a lower cost and humane way to solve uh, and address this problem. Thank you, Professor. Before we move on to Mark, I wanted to ask you a question. How was this material, the, the response, received by those decision makers that you were pitching it to? Yeah, so when we, we Jens was, is involved in this as well, and we went, and we had a meeting with the detention center staff, the staff who had been implementing it, and we were mostly meeting with them because we wanted to understand from them uh, what, what things look like in practice when you're actually implementing this and what works and what doesn't. And so we showed them the results and they were incredibly thankful to us to show them because they sort of believed that it was working but when you think something's working and then you know half of the kids you you were working with and trying to re rehabilitate are showing back up in jail uh, within six months it's incredibly disheartening so the the evidence for them was made them feel great in it and it sort of reaffirmed things that they kind of hoped were true but weren't really sure about so it's part of it just translating the data to reinforce their own Perceptions? Exactly. You know, so what they see is failure, failure, failure. Kids are coming back. They're, they're committing more crimes and getting arrested and coming back. But when they see the data, they can sort of see, okay, this is actually making a difference relative to the, the alternative for these kids. All right. Thank you. Mark? First of all, I would like to, to do a, a group exercise. I'll be very quick with it. Uh, but I need as, as much participation as I can. Does everyone have a pen at, in front of you at your table? If you do, you have a, a paper. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. Uh, don't look to the left or your right, but I want you to write uh, this answer down, the first thing that comes to your head. I would like you to uh, pick a number one through four off the top of your head and write it down now. Wonderful. Um, now I'm going to ask you all to shout out uh, the number. Uh, I'm going to count three, two, one, and when I get to one, to shout out what your number is quickly, okay? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes. All right. Three, two, one. Three. What number did you hear most? Three. Isn't that amazing? Uh, who had three? And you had three. Excellent. <laughs> All right. That, that is the, the, the context of where we're going. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, not too late. Reducing disparities in academic outcomes amongst youth. One of the challenges we have is a reality that things look like they are the same. Um, that when you look at a public high school graduation rates uh, using race as an indicator, things have not gone up and they've not gone down. It's, it's kind of flatlined. And that's a challenge, uh, especially when it's not going so well in the first place. Uh, we have communities that are struggling. This is a, a house in Inglewood. Uh, we have social displacement. We have a number of, in, uh, when I was going to high school, I knew everyone on my block. If I did something wrong, somebody told my parent before I got home. Uh, now we have uh, many youth that when we try to call home to their parents, they're actually living together as students. And they have an older student taking care of everybody. Uh, so there's, there's massive challenges in different communities. People are facing things that many of us haven't thought about facing or even considered. We have a challenge of communication. Uh, one of the things I think is critically important for everyone here is onion aseyo, kamsa hamnida, ah, chamaneo. And I think it's just a really good thing. Shlamalo uh, kondaki, da, hamoro, sika. I asked you something. Nobody answered. What was the answer to the question I just asked? <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, for a number of our students, we look at our freshmen and sophomores going into school and looking at uh, the, the algebra grade as an indicator of whether they'll graduate or not. Uh, when we start dealing with systems and start dealing with formulas, for many of them, we're speaking a foreign language. And so what happens is you don't have students who are not capable or not willing to do the math. They just don't understand what you're saying. Because we have a number of students who are coming to school uh, with a third grade math uh, ability or a reading ability. And so you have to build their skills along with the curriculum. And so we have a number of students who are facing this challenge. And this is one of the reasons why we haven't seen a rise 
uh, in, in, in schools throughout Chicago, but also across the nation. Um, as we look through the formulas, we go to Harper High School. Last year, uh, there was a, a randomized study uh, that was focused on what can we do to change this system? What can we do so that we can get everyone not saying three? It would have been lovely to have a, a cacophony of sound with everybody saying a different number, but the threes had it uh, by a far margin, and then there was a two. I think I heard one one. Was, who, who had one? Two ones. All right, that's, that's, that's good. <laughs> So what we, what we did is last year we went into Harper High School and we, uh, University of Chicago connected and doing a gold standard study, which is the same type of trial that you would use for medicine to, to see if something works. Um, and did hired Match and then went with BAM. Match does two-on-one high impact math tutoring. Uh, its focus is it's one tutor, two students. And the way the layout goes is that um, a student starts off the period silently. Uh, we have five minutes silent and it emulates a testing environment. And then we start up with skills. And so we deal with their skills because we need to catch them up because CPS has tremendous teachers, but oftentimes it's hard to teach the material if your student can't multiply or doesn't know what five plus five is. Uh, so we build that up. We build up their skills alongside with uh, the curriculum. Uh, we invest time in them. We call their parents once a week to let them know how their students are doing. Uh, we start off with only good things because sometimes parents or guardians, uh, all they hear is bad news. And we begin to radically work on the confidence of the student. And so we have five minutes in the beginning of the period, five minutes at the end of the period, which is silent, which is a test on what they've learned in that period. And then we start the next day five minutes silent, testing on what they learned the day before. So there's a, there's a high amount of ratio, which means there's a lot of work where the student is doing the work and we're checking for understanding. And the time on task is over 95% per class. So they have 50, 50 minutes of intense math. And we try to make it as fun as possible. Also, at the same time, a BAM gives that, that social, psychological, and relational behavioral issue. So they start working with them, and they, they train, come together, share, and mentor them. And so they can deal, manage anger, manage a lot of the issues that they're dealing with from society. You have a number of students that come to school, and they have Tattoos with the ripped, RIP, and a name. Uh, the number of people, uh, students who have lost somebody that they knew they were very close to is astronomical. And so many of them come into high school not with a expectancy that they won't graduate, that they won't even live to see graduation. And so we, we try to work, VAM works wonderfully to work through that process, to work through grief, to work through anger, to work through that pain, while we come, come alongside and we work on the academics and we also build a relationship there. And so compared to other students, BAM and MATCH kids seem like they're struggling. Uh, as we did the study, we had a number of students uh, and someone who said, well, listen, there was, there was a, a gradation you, you've, you've increased, but uh, I don't see any valedictorian here. Where, where are the valedictorians? And, and what we find is we have a number of students who had Fs who ended up with Cs. That's tremendous. Uh, students who were afraid to speak in class and they would act up in class because they were covering up the fact that they didn't know the material. And now they have a, a level of confidence that they're beginning to ask questions, they're engaging with the teacher. And so we saw a lot of change uh, last year during the study. These students are high risk before the study even begins. Most of these students aren't expected to graduate. And most of these students, if they don't graduate, if they fail uh, algebra and they fail geometry, will not graduate, will end up some kind of way in the criminal system. Um, but we find that students who, are, who have done the work, their uh, number of incidents have decreased, and their ability to do the work has pushed their effectiveness in other classes also. Um, the randomization of the students to the program and the control allows a like-to-like -like comparison, so we can isolate the, the program's effect. All, what we're doing in the study is to make sure that we can say, what is the difference? What is making the, ch uh, the change in the student? Is the, the two-on-one high-impact tutoring making a difference? Is uh, the BAM counseling making a difference? So the study uh, looked at that uh, last year and it, amazing effects. We what we find from the evaluation of this random, uh, control trial, randomized control, tri control trial in Harper High School shows that we've leapt the gap. We've gone from, to just give you a, a kind of an, a, an example, we've gone to someone operating at a third grade level to at level in, a, in one year. That's a huge leap. And this is the control group. So you see 
the program uh, participants' participation increases in CPS on track rate by almost 50%, which means they're not failing. So these are students who are going to graduate. These are students who have opportunity to go to college and beyond. Now this is cost effective. The cost effective even for, uh, for when you look at this, it's interesting. I'm going to use this, but I want to just reference this. Uh, it was an article in the New York Times that said that and when you look in the federal system, it costs 170000 per inmate. Uh, if we can redistribute that, those funds into education, the amount that we can do, we can actually cut the prison rate, cut the incarceration rate, and also lower violence throughout society, not just in Inglewood, not just in Roseland or areas like that, but across the country. One of the questions, and, and this is something that comes up, is, is why freshmen? Uh, there are different studies about uh, Cullen and Levitt uh, deal with vocational uh, options of trying to get the trade. Uh, Heckman deals with uh, early uh, childhood prevention and, and beginning to change things and coming at an early age. But we found that, that when you put uh, really the, the cost-benefit ratio, if you can get a student who is at a freshman level, who is at a third grade level coming in, in one year to be on track. That's a great investment. That's an area where you can focus in, in one to two years where there is need. And so that it becomes sustainable and it becomes, uh, you can institute it so you can actually spread it. Uh, so you can ratchet up or ratchet down as far as size. The last piece on this is you pick three. Can you answer why you pick three? Why did you pick three? Oh, okay. all right. That's, that's actually fantastic. <laughs> that's good to know. Yes, ma'am. If I was to do it again, would you pick three? When you have the intervention of match and you have the intervention of BAM, these students don't do it again. They change behavior because they have confidence and we begin to touch the things that cause the challenges in the first place as far as getting their confidence, getting them up to, to pace, and having changing their expectation that they're not looking to die or don't think they're going to graduate, but they're actually looking to go to college and make a difference. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, a project that I've been working on for uh, about 15 years. So you might think, how can someone who looks like he's 16 have been working on a project for 15 years? <laughs> We're just going to leave that as one of the great mysteries of the University of Chicago's new urban initiative. Um, I, want to, um, I want to take you of a quick walking tour uh, of my neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. So I live, let me see if I'm... This is a test of my hand-eye coordination. So I live in Hyde Park, right about where this pin is located. And if you walk down 57th Street in Hyde Park, you get to Ray Elementary School, where uh, about 58% of the kids pass the Illinois State Achievement Test, uh, the ISAT test in math. So 58% doesn't sound uh, super great, but it's actually a little above the CPS system-wide average. Um, the, the boundary between Hyde Park and Woodlawn, the neighborhood to the south, which is much higher poverty, is basically the midway. So if you walk from uh, Ray Elementary School down Kimbark, you get to 66th and Kimbark, uh, which is Woodlawn Community School. The ISAT math pass rate at Kimbark um, Community School is about 15 percentage points lower than what you see at, uh, at Ray, so 43%. And then if you hang a, uh, a right and go west on 66th, 6th, you get to uh, Ellis and 66th at Wadsworth Elementary, where about 15%, 15% of the elementary school kids pass the ISAT math test. So um, this illustrates a pattern that we see in every single American city of massive variation, massive differences across neighborhoods and how kids are doing in school and how they're doing in all sorts of other areas of life, which has led to a, a very extensive um, theoretical literature in social science arguing that the neighborhood environments themselves for these kids must be a contributing factor to uh, how the kids are doing. That is, even if you look at poor kids in Woodlawn and poor kids in Hyde Park, on average, the test scores for the poor kids in Hyde Park are higher. 
Uh, lots of explanations for why the neighborhood environment itself might matter. William Julius Wilson, for instance, famously argued that in the 1960s, the exodus of middle class families from segregated neighborhoods deprived those areas of uh, important resources and, and role models and so on. Um, and the policy implication of that hypothesis, if true, is that poor families living in high poverty neighborhoods are doubly disadvantaged. So it's not just bad enough that you're a kid growing up in a poor family, but now you're surrounded by poverty in your neighborhood, which is further depressing your life chances. Um, to the extent to which that hypothesis is true, this is also a concern for public policy because the problem is getting worse over time. If you look at levels of income segregation in the United States over the last, say, 30 or 40 years, income segregation across neighborhoods has been going up, especially for African American families, as you can see in this graph from 1970 through 2010. Now, um, the key challenge for social science in determining whether neighborhoods really matter is that families aren't usually randomly assigned to live in a particular neighborhood. When you look at a low-income mom trying to raise two kids living in Woodlawn, and you see an, uh, a low-income mom raising two kids in the Hyde Park neighborhood, um, one possibility is there are different differences in the kids' schooling outcomes is due to the neighborhood environment. The other possibility is that it could be due to something about the low-income mom who figured out a way to get or keep her family in Hyde Park, as opposed to living in the much more dangerous and distressed Woodlawn neighborhood. Um, this has been a topic of a huge social science literature for uh, literally hundreds of years. And uh, in the 1990s, this is obviously core to a lot of po uh, housing housing policy questions and a lot of questions that the US Department of Housing and Urban Development specifically works on. And so in the 1990s, HUD funded the first randomized control trial of the sort that provides gold standard evidence in medicine to test this hypothesis, where HUD uh, enrolled 4,600 families living in some of the most distressed public housing projects in the country across five cities, Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, LA, and New York, and then basically randomly assigned them to either get housing vouchers and the chance to move to a much lower poverty neighborhood or to stay where they were in public housing. So this now generates comparable groups of families living in dramatically different sorts of neighborhood environments and then we can follow the families up to see whether there are in fact differences on average in how the kids are doing. Uh, and if so, that would be convincing evidence that neighborhoods really do matter because uh, absent the mobility intervention because of random assignment, the two groups should have had identical follow-up outcomes uh, on average. Um, let me show you, um, so uh, this is a picture from the Chicago site. You might be wondering um, which supermax prison that is on the left there. That actually turns out to be one of the Robert Taylor home high rises uh, located uh, right near State Street and 55th, about a mile west of where I live in Hyde Park. Um, you can see, this is a picture on the right of what one of the open air breezeways uh, looks like the, uh, on the inside. This is where the families, the MTO families at Baseline were living. You can see that the floor to ceiling steel cage there just further contributes to the supermax aesthetic. So that's where families uh, were coming from and where control group families basically stayed in MTO. Um, this is a picture of where families, uh, the sort of low poverty neighborhood into which families moved in MTO. So it's, uh, you know, it's not quite as fancy as the North Shore suburb where John lives. It's kind of Hyde Parkish in its uh, <laughs> presence of trash and uh, bars on doors. But um, when you look over the 10 to 15 years after families were randomly assigned in MTO, the average control group family was living in a neighborhood in a census tract where 40% of all of the families were poor, living below the federal poverty line. And the families who move with an MTO housing voucher are living in neighborhoods where the average poverty rate is about 20%. So MTO cuts your neighborhood poverty rate in half. Some of you might be thinking, well, 20% still feels like a lot of poor families. One way to think about this is the uh, average poverty rate in the five cities in which MTO was carried out is about 20%. So the usual way that people who study income segregation think about this is perfect segregation is defined as uh, a situation where each neighborhood in the city 
has exactly the same share poor as the city as a whole, right? And in a city where the, the poverty rate is 20%, living in a neighborhood where 20% of the people are poor represents the ideal scenario of perfect poverty integration in the city. So what happens to kids' outcomes when you cut their neighborhood poverty rate in half and move them to this situation that corresponds to the ideal of perfect poverty concentration? As one way to benchmark the results that I'm about to show you, the black-white test score gap in national data is about 0.8 standard deviations. The match tutoring intervention that uh, Mr. Saint just described generates a, um, uh, a gain in achievement test scores of about uh, half a standard deviation, so that's about 60% of the black-white gap. Here's the effect of cutting your neighborhood poverty rate by half on kids' test scores. Oh, wait, here it is. Basically, zero. Zero to negative. So absolutely no detect. And you can also see that these, these are standard deviation uh, units here. So it's, uh, you know, it's like 0.03 change in standard deviation test scores, which is not statistically significant. Um, when we started the research, we had the intuition that, well, we should expect to see particularly huge changes in kids' test scores for the kids who are preschool age at baseline. These kids are experiencing really dramatic changes in neighborhood environments when they're most developmentally plastic, unlike maybe the teenagers are already so far down this road that it's very hard to change their outcomes. You can see in the top panel here, we look at specifically at kids who are zero to five at baseline, and you don't see any change, any detectable change in achievement test scores for them either. Okay, so what is the, um, what is the point of this? So it is not the case, so moving opportunity did find uh, evidence of important changes in other life outcomes for these families, right? So the point is not that neighborhoods don't matter for, for families' outcomes. Um, the key point that I wanted to uh, the key point that I wanted to convey is that the differences that we see across neighborhoods in um, uh, in kids' achievement test scores and the hundreds or thousands of uh, theoretical studies in social sciences claiming that that must be due in large part to um, uh, neighborhood environments uh, is not right. It's not it's not right. Uh, at least it's not right for these sorts of families within the range of neighborhood variation that we tend to see uh, in modern American cities. Um, there's a policy lesson and then a larger lesson that I think ties together the three uh, presentations on this panel. So there are lots and lots of reasons, lots and lots of reasons that public policymakers might want to support housing policies that reduce income and racial segregation in Chicago and other American big cities. Um, but if you think that those policies are going to be a panacea for disparities in how kids are doing in school, um, you will be mistaken. And much more direct policy efforts are gonna be required to address this problem that everybody cares about is differences in how kids are doing in school as a function of uh, the accident of their birth. The other sort of lesson that I think ties together the three presentations is um, if you look at the area of medicine, uh, before Merck can go sell you any sort of pill or bef before any medical device manufacturer can sell you any sort of medical device, uh, that company is required by the FDA to go out and do a randomized control trial to determine whether the thing actually works. Um, that is not at all how public policy gets made in the United States or in any other country, for that matter, right now. Um, we basically just make it up. We look around, we take a guess about the way the world works. Uh, we have some intuition, we have a hunch. Our cousin moved from here to there, and that makes us think their kids started to do a lot better, and so it must be, so on and so on. Um, I think it is not too much to say that in the area of public policy, we are not far, so far advanced from the era of applying leeches, if you wanted to think about the medical, medical analogy. Um, this is a big problem. This is an enormous problem across crime, as John's, uh, John's example showed, across education, as Mr. Saint's presentation showed, uh, across housing and education policy uh, in my presentation as well. I think it suggests the incredible importance and value 
of trying to export this very evidence-based orientation uh, from medicine into the public policy arena as well. Thanks very much. So before we turn it over to the audience for a question, I want to take moderator's prerogative and follow up on something that Mark, you had mentioned about you know, the, the amount of money that we spend on prisons versus how much we can be spending on kids. Uh, the fact that we've known for a long time. So what, what is different now, or are you seeing any difference in the response to the programming that you, or the evidence that you're showing? Uh, from last year's study, uh, I think it just works. The beauty of it is we can show that it works, and, and everything is indicating that it will work anywhere, it's scalable anywhere, uh, and it's effective. And therefore, the cost-benefit ratio is, is tremendous. And Jens, would you say that most of that is due to the RCT nature? Oh, the, the policy influence? Right. Yeah, I think um, uh, it is, uh, in, my, in my experience, it certainly seems to be the case. So we have a, uh, you know, the, the work that we're doing at the, at the University of Chicago Crime Lab at Urban Education Lab, I think, is based on um, this implicit or barely explicit theory of social change that says the way to change policy is to um, do demonstration projects that show the public sector what actually works with the hope of policymakers then picking up on those interventions that do seem promising and taking them to scale. And it certainly seems to be the case that randomized trials have particular power in that, in that model. Uh, everybody intuitively gets what they are and I think in the scientific community, there's, uh, in, in my view, no serious debate that they provide uh, far and away the best, uh, the best evidence for policy impacts on people's lives. They're very non-leech-like. Very non-leech-like, yeah. All right, I'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. If you could raise your hand if you have anything. We have somebody walking around with a microphone. Does anyone have any questions? Well, there has to be something before I have to start pegging with more. Anyone? Okay, there we go. So, hi, uh, Alden Reed from Hyde. I was actually curious. Um, uh, you said that. Is this on? Okay. Uh, um, you, you mentioned sort of some of the mixed results of the MTO experiment using just the school outcomes lens. You find that mobility programs don't have the anticipated effects. Um, can, you talk, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, where effects were found and how you would go about, because I, I think you're, you're using one lens um, in order to determine whether the neighborhood effects literature has merit and if there were other effects that were potent and you know, um, uh, um, uh, demonstrated through the experiment, then it may not be an issue of uh, whether it failed or not, but how you're using mobility. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So let me, I, I, um, let me just try and um, reiterate a point that I tried to make uh, at the end of my talk, which is that I, um, uh, I didn't intend for my, uh, I focused on achievement test scores not because I think the only reason to support housing mobility interventions is because of kids' achievement test scores. But I think that that is a very powerful example of the sort of the larger uh, scientific approach that I think unites the three presentations on the panel. So achievement test scores is one area where your everyday experience makes you think that neighborhoods surely must contribute to how kids are doing in school. Uh, lots and lots of non-experimental uh, studies in the neighborhood effects literature have argued that they're really important schooling effects. And the experiment in that very important domain shows that that's not the case. Now, um, it is for sure the case that there, so HUD, when uh, the legislation was uh, signed uh, by Congress to support moving to opportunity, the, it talks about two key outcomes in particular for families, education and labor market outcomes for, for the moms. And you don't see any impact at all on labor market outcomes at all for moms either. Um, however, what you do see, um, what you do see is huge changes in physical and mental health for these families, uh, which is a really, really important domain from the perspective of the families themselves. And you also see really big changes in safety for these families, which they turn out to care a huge amount about as well. And so I think certainly from the perspective of the families themselves, their lives were made much, much better off 
by the housing mobility intervention. And so I'm glad you asked the question so I can just reinforce the idea that there were lots of good things going on. But I think the, the contrast between you know, the, everyone's intuition about labor market outcomes and schooling outcomes being tied to, uh, affected by neighborhoods <laughs> in contrast to what the MTO experiment said, I think is a very sobering example of uh, the dangers of relying on intuition and theory and non-experimental research alone. We had one in the back a minute ago. Does anyone have another one? I wanted to ask quickly, you know, all three of you work in Chicago. Um, is there anything do you think about Chicago and its policymakers and their adoption of programs like this that is only inherent to Chicago, or is this something that you've seen extrapolation to other cities? Do you want me to um, you go ahead. No, go ahead, John. <laughs> so one uh, one thing that is uh, unique about Chicago, not totally unique about Chicago, but Chicago is certainly in the band of cities that's a leader in this regard, is the administrative data infrastructure that we have to, um, to do these sorts of policy experiments. So it is enormously expensive to hire a, a, a firm to go out and interview people to measure what's going on in their lives. And if you had to do, if you had to measure what the impacts of these policy experiments are on people's life outcomes, relying entirely on surveys, every one of these studies would cost 10 or 20 times what they actually cost. Um, none of them would actually be done. We'd still be writing grant proposals to try and fund them. And so Chicago is fantastic in having the administrative data infrastructure to do this sort of work. And I think this administration uh, in Chicago has also made that a big priority. And so I think that's um, the other thing that I would just um, I would just say, I lived in Washington, DC for 12 years before coming to the University of Chicago in 2007, and, and one of the other things that's really striking to me about the city of Chicago is that there are a lot of people who really care a lot about the city. Um, so in DC, uh, DC's, I realize, aberrant in a different way. It's sort of a company town built on um, the federal government. I've heard people describe it as Hollywood for ugly people. <laughs> um, I always thought when I lived there, somehow this makes a lot of sense to me. Um, <laughs> the uh, but Chicago, and nobody really cared so much about the city itself. And in Chicago, one of the things that I've most been most impressed about is that there are a bunch of foundations, there are a bunch of nonprofit community organizations, there are a bunch of individual philanthropists who just really, really care about the place and I think um, are helpful to this larger enterprise in a variety of ways. So before we close out, I wanted to, each of you, if you could, to just mention briefly where you're taking your work now, whether it's with RCTs or off of the work that you described. Uh, to the next level of developing evidence. And John, if we want to start with you. Uh, sure. So, I mean, we're in the particular study that I was talking about at the, the JTDC, we're collecting additional data from the administrative data sources that Jens is talking about to look at effects on, um, on arrests themselves. And uh, eventually, we're going to hopefully look in the long run. One of the nice things about being able to rely on administrative data for outcomes is that you can look at, once, once a randomized control trial has happened, you can look at outcomes far down the road without having to follow people because the, the data is collected already. So for instance, there's earnings records that you can potentially get uh, for research purposes and link that back to the people who are in the study and you could look at long-term effects on things like earnings. So that's some of the work we're doing on that project. Great, Mark? Uh, we're continuing the process uh, is underway, uh, but Jens has warned me on pain of death that I can't say anything because it's a randomized study. So uh, <laughs> I could just say, uh, if, if, don't tell him. It looks promising. <laughs> yes. Mark, surely a, a, a physical threat for me can't really be that credible. <laughs> um, the, the main thing that we're trying to do next, we have this uh, big team of researchers around the country, is we, um, we realize in, an area, in some areas, randomized trials are easier to do than others. And with respect to something like neighborhood effects, randomized trials are very difficult to do. And so we're trying to figure out methodologically um, when you really need to do an experiment in this area and when you can get away with something other than a randomized trial and still get the right answer. Great. I think we had one right in the middle. Hi, Jesus Strauss. Uh, my question is, from your policy lesson, you say that you want to boost school outcomes. So your policy lesson is if you want to boost school student outcomes, you know, do it, don't do the bank shot method. 
But my question is, through your research, are there any out-of-school time factors that have at least been statistically, you know, strongly correlated to education outcomes, whether you define it by graduation rate or test score? So, you know, there has to be something that is statistically significant that can, you know, in the out-of-school time or the out-of-school factors that can affect grad, uh, student outcomes. So what are those things? So I... Um that's a very good question. I, I think that, uh, you know, my reading of the literature is that, uh, you know, pe people have long um, yearned for uh, some sort of intervention that could make uh, household environments more developmentally productive for low-income kids, you know, and I'm happy to stay around after the panel and talk about uh, the research on that, but my own reading is that we don't have a lot of success stories. So we have maybe the nurse-family uh, uh, partnership that sending nurses to uh, first-time teen moms while they're pregnant and talking to them about how to be more developmentally productive moms, that seems encouraging. And other than that, we don't have a lot of great success stories. I think what is interesting about um, the two interventions that Mark described, both BAM and MATCH, is that they are both done uh, during the school setting, even the BAM program, which focuses on something other than academics. And I think one of the reasons that the program providers believe that is so important is because uh, that is so central, according to them, to get the kids to actually participate at high levels. Um, and I think, I'm sure that Mark is happy to stick around and talk more after the panel as well, but I think the field is littered with examples of uh, after-school programs or weekend programs that uh, can fall apart when taken to scale because it is so hard to sustain engagement over the long term. Can I, oh, we got one more. Can I just add one thing to that? Sorry. Oh, yeah. So one, just one quick thing to add is, um, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to walk away thinking that we're tr we're implying that there aren't things outside of school that contribute to kids' educational success. There certainly are, and one of the so one of the points, uh, you know, that comes out of the the JTDC ex uh, experiment is that you can potential you can uh, have big effects on people. Um, uh, positive effects, even without uh, solving whatever the root cause was of their involvement in criminal activity. So it might, it may very well be that the the root, in some sense, the root cause of the you know the why the kids are ending up in the JTDC in the first place was poverty. Uh, but the the point is that you potentially can help them make better decisions even without solving poverty. Now it would be better if we could get we could get rid of poverty, but that's very hard. And maybe it, you know a more feasible thing would be to do something like this, which can change outcomes without getting at the root cause. So, the fact that you know tutoring has really big impacts on kids' test scores doesn't mean that there aren't other things that are contributing to the fact the reason why they had low test scores in the first place. But it's possible that schools can make big differences without solving all of the problems that are happening outside the school walls. I'm Katie Olson. I'm with UI Labs. Um, I just had a question um, for the panel. Um, you know, the first panel we talked about how um, when the city made um, data public via the, the portal, um, we were able to see how their department and other city departments um, are able to turn that data into a productive use, whether it's by proactively um, combating rodents or, you know, in the second panel, so, so the same theme. You know, we saw how um, the city water department, you know, the city um, might be able to um, change the, the way that people utilize water as a commodity if they're made aware of that. Um, and we have things like installing meters so people can sort of gauge how they're utilizing water. So what's, what's the equivalent um, with, um, with the data that you, um, the outcomes that you've learned from your research? Um, what's the best way for you in academia to share um, what you've learned through, um, through these um, controlled tests um, in such a way that nonprofits or the city might be able to utilize that data um, for designing policy and, and programs in the future. No, go ahead, you got it. <laughs> or I'm calling on somebody, John. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess uh, uh, before I answer your question, I just one thing to point out is that the, the way we're thinking about using data is a little different than the way I wasn't at the earlier sessions, but I I'm can infer the way that data is used in those settings, um, you could imagine them being complementary. So uh, uh, it may be, it seems totally reasonable that making people aware of, of things by uh, making data salient to them could change their behavior. 
But that, in some sense, from my perspective, is, is a hypothesis, and then you could imagine running a randomized control trial to test it, right? And so those, those two things are slightly different. From the, from the standpoint of your, your actual question, um, one of the things, so Jens and I are co-directors of something called the University of Chicago Urban Education Lab, and Jens is the founding uh, director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab. And um, one of the goals of both of those organizations is to help facilitate more and more of these types of randomized controlled trials and to do so in a way that doesn't just measure the effectiveness of uh, programs and policies, but measures their cost effectiveness so that you can compare two different programs on, uh, on an equal footing. You know, so for if you had a, an extra million dollars to spend and you were policymakers, what's the most effective way to do that? Um, and so one of the, the long-term goals of this is to, as we build up more and more evidence, to make that, those findings uh, easily accessible uh, at the, the crime lab and the urban education lab website um, so that, you know, policymakers, once there is a, a big portfolio of these types of uh, interventions, they can, that, that'll be the place to look. But Yeah, let me just add one quick thing to that, too. There's one, one more goal that I think John implicitly had in mind, but let me just make it explicit, is the, the other goal of what we're trying to do with his work is um, to identify why these programs are working. And uh, the, um, I think what we, I, I think the, the vision for large scale impact is not that Youth Guidance, the developer of the Becoming a Man program, becomes like the, um, that Mark mentioned. I don't think that Youth Guidance has aspirations to become the Exxon of positive youth development, where they are a $50 billion a year industry providing these services to everyone. I think the, the real way to have impact at scale is to figure out what the active ingredient is for these different interventions so that other community organizations can ramp up the dosage of those active ingredients for what they're, what they're doing as well. And so like when you go to, I go to Walgreens in Hyde Park because I got a headache and I see Tylenol and then I see the Walgreens acetaminophen or whatever the, John's nodding so I must have gotten that right. Um, it is hugely helpful to know that uh, you know those are comparable products, and it doesn't really matter which one I take. And I think that kind of uh, vision of um, uh, of active ingredient and scale up for lots of other programs, it, you should be thinking about the active ingredients and not any particular program brand name as the overarching goal of what we're trying to do. And that completes our time. Please join me in thanking our panel. I do want to express appreciation to the panelists, to the University of Chicago for what has been a very stimulating afternoon, and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is delighted to have been a partner. Um, some people might ask why the council is so involved in the affairs of our city with what seemed to be local matters, not global. But we're, we're a world's affairs council, after all, so we'd be expected to pay more attention to Ukraine or Thailand, not to our own backyard. Well, we do pay attention to Ukraine and Thailand, for sure. But our mandate embraces, perhaps first and foremost, Chicago and its growing role as a global city. A few years ago, we changed our name from the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations to the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and that tells it all. In this globalizing age, Nothing is really foreign anymore, and nothing for that matter is strictly local. It's all global now. We feel you really don't understand the city in which you live until you understand how it fits into globalization and the world. And you can't solve your city's problems without tapping into the knowledge from other cities around the globe <coughs> using the data that's becoming available. Well, this is what this forum today has been all about using our 21st century tools to help build and sustain a world-class city, and it's also what Medellin will be all about. It's what our Global Chicago Center has been working on for more than a decade now, and why we co-sponsored a conference last year with the U of C, Northwestern University of Illinois, bringing together major research universities from around the world on using their resources, especially data, big data, to help solve urban problems in health, education, and other areas. As has been pointed out today, cities are the future now. 
and there's a global conversation going on about the urban future. We're grateful to the University of Chicago, to its Office of Civic Engagement and its Global Engagement Office, and to the other partners here uh, for the chance to add our voice to this conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just want to say how grateful we are at the University of Chicago and honored to have been able to host this pre-conference today. Um, I'm Derek Douglas, Vice President for Civic Engagement at the University. And on behalf of myself and our office and my colleague, Ian Solomon, who's the Vice President for Global Engagement, we're really delighted to have been able to host what has been a tremendous conversation today. Um, I also want to thank a few folks. First, um, there was a lot of work put into making a conference and an event like this come off well. And people in my office in particular, I have to single out Elena Beverly, who's here, who did a lot of the work in helping to put this together with our partners. I also want to thank the co-hosts, UN Habitat, HUD, the MacArthur Foundation, and Chicago Sister Cities for collaborating with us on this um, incredible event. Also, the panelists and all of you attendees, this was designed to be a session that was interactive, where we could share ideas, thoughts, research with you, but also engage in conversation and questions from you. And I caught the tail end of it, but what I caught um, with the crime panel was, I think, really incredible and really valuable to everyone here. Um, there was clearly a lot of tremendous information that was provided today by the scholars and the practitioners that were on the panel. And I think if you boiled it all down, there are a few lessons that kind of just stand out that are they're obvious, but they, they bear repeating. Um, I think the first clear lesson is that dat data matters. And I used to work in the White House, and I can attest to what Jens was talking about. When you're a policymaker, you know, the, the greatest thing you can be provided is a policy solution that's grounded in evidence. Because many times people come to you with ideas, things that they think will work or won't work, but you don't necessarily have a strong basis and evidence for knowing that will actually make a difference. And what we heard today in each of the sessions were the use of data, um, both understanding data and understanding how to use it to solve the challenges and to take advantage of the opportunities that exist in cities. And I think that that lesson is really critical and has um, impact not just in Chicago, but in cities everywhere. The second takeaway for me was that partnership matters. If you look at all the interventions and the ideas that were discussed today, all of them involved a collection of different stakeholders bringing their expertise to bear to solve an issue. Whether it's the academic side and the scholars at these universities, whether it's the public sector, um, policymakers at the city, federal, or state level, whether it's the foundations and the philanthropic sector, the nonprofit organizations, like the, the example that from Crime Lab with Youth Guidance, also the private sector and the community. You need that collection to come together to really take on and solve and address the biggest challenges that exist in urban communities. And I don't think any one um, actor can do it alone. Today was a great um, evidence of that. And I think finally, as Richard mentioned, um, all the issues today, be it urban science, big data, health, water, education, crime, they all have global relevance. Um, what you do in Chicago or what you do in cities across the, the country are very relevant to the issues that other cities and urban communities around the world are facing. And the issues and the things and the solutions that they're doing in other parts of the world can be relevant and inform what we're doing here. And so that is why, to my mind, the issues that were discussed today and just having this precursor event for the World Urban Forum was so important and so valuable. These are the topics that are going to be discussed in Colombia and Medellin next month. Um, I think it's wonderful that the University of Chicago and our, the partners here in Chicago will be able to play a role in that conference to help inform and engage with leaders from across the world who are also dealing with similar challenges and trying to take advantage of similar, op similar opportunities in their communities. So let me just thank you all again for coming. I hope you enjoyed today's event. There's on your table a little housekeeping. There's a form um, that 
if you'd like to get, if you're going to be going to the World Urban Forum or if you'd like to get more information and receive updates leading up to the forum, if you could just put down your information there. There are going to be summaries of the, the sessions today. Um, we're going to be making that material available going into the, the World Urban Forum Conference. Um, we can also share other updates with you as, as things progress. So if you'd like to get that information, please fill that out. Um, finally, as Richard alluded to, we have some stuff to drink in the back for those who want it. Um, so please enjoy the reception and enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you again for being with us today.